Okay. Um, I think this is going to work and this is going to go to my face here, but maybe not. Can everybody hear me? Carol, can everybody hear me? Are we good to go on the sound? Yes. Carol, can can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, hi, my name is Jamie Robertson, and thanks again for everybody coming out on a beautiful uh, evening to hear me talk about this. Um, and yeah, the Prior Mountains map. Uh, it was a collaboration with Karen Carter Graphics, Wild Montana, and uh, big support from the Billions Community Foundation to put it together. So I'm excited to, to tell you a little bit about the process here, about how it all, all came together. Um, I had never been to the Priors before, before our fieldwork trip. Um, so I was blown away at the diversity and just how, how beautiful it was there. Um, we had this beautiful October stretch of time last October to, to do the work. Um, and here's a shot of the fall foliage down in uh, down in the canyon. Um, and we also went up on top and we got up on East Pryor and got to hike around and see the moody weather. I'm sure you're all very familiar with this landscape here, um, but it was all new to us. So um, I should say my, myself and my, uh, my wife, Amelia, are the two people behind Karen Carter Graphics. So we were both, when I say we, that's, that's who I'm talking about. Um, and then uh, I, I had sort of heard about it, but was also blown away just by the Red Rock uh, part of the South and just how how amazing that was to still be in Montana and to be in that landscape. So uh, just such a cool area. Um, just a little bit about the, the history of this project. Uh, it de definitely did take a little longer than we thought, but that's most projects, I guess. Um, July, 2021, we got the, or Aubrey, I should say, and others at Wild Montana got the grant with the Billings Community Foundation. And then it wasn't until October 2022 that we did the field work. Um, and then this last winter, we did the, all the computer work, the GIS data processing um, and the actual map creation. Um, March 2023 was the map revisions. I sent it around and got feedback from lots of people. Um, we printed the map in April. Um, and then we had a release event in Billings last month, which maybe some of you attended. Um, we attempted to give this conversation, but it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a noisy venue. So hopefully you can all hear me better than that event. Um, and just a special thanks to Aubrey, Ian, and Simon, and everybody else who wasn't named here, but uh, many hands to put this all together. So thanks a lot. All right, so I'm gonna dive into our process. Um, so I hope you're ready to, to learn about how a map gets put together. Um, so we've been making maps at Karen Carter Graphics since 2011. Um, most of our maps have been centered on kind of Western Montana and Idaho. So the Selway Bitterroot, the Bob Marshall, uh, the Rattlesnake, the Missions, that those areas over there is kind of where we've been. So this was certainly one of the more far-flung maps for us. Um, but yeah, it was it was neat to to explore a totally new area to us. So the first the first thing we do with any map, and this one wasn't in particular wasn't any different, was to um, gather all the available data. So you know, like like a lot of places we make maps of it, it's a patchwork of different agencies, different jurisdictions. So we have the, the Crow Tribe lands to the north. We have the Custer Gallatin National Forest. We have the Park Service and we have BLM and across state lines. So it's this huge puzzle to put together all of these different agencies and different plans to come to a cohesive uh, map at the end. So we start with whatever we can get from the agencies, whether it's BLM, Forest Service or otherwise. Um, and I'm sure many of you have seen these access maps before, uh, but this is where we started with those. Um, and the next thing we did is field work. So last October, um, we went to the priors and hiked all the trails, 
that we could and got on as many of the roads as we could in our time available um, and did all the field work pretty quickly because it was a relatively small area. Um, but the we, we keep things pretty simple, pretty simple in the field. Um, we collect lots of geotagged photos with our phones with an app called Solocator. And that allows us to geotag photos and then see them in the computer in the GIS, which is our computer mapping component. Um, so tons of those. And then this little black box that you see right here is what we call a data logger. And it just records everywhere we go as a track. Uh, but the most useful thing is that it has a microphone that's attached to a waypoint. So we can hit a button and record a voice file that is then tagged with that waypoint on the map. So we can collect everything, whether it's road data, signs, creek crossings, trailheads, anything. We can record it and have a voice file attached to that point that we can then transcribe later on. Um, and that just allows us to really quickly and efficiently collect lots of data in the field um, without a lot of friction there. And then I would be remiss if I didn't uh, highlight the print atlases. I'm a, I'm a print map lover, obviously, and we uh, swear by our benchmark atlases to help us navigate through different states and jurisdictions and you know just cross all the borders. So we, we, we use those a lot. Um, and then the next huge step was after the field is to do all of the GIS data processing. Um, and in an application called QGIS or quantum GIS is what we use. Um, and this is a very involved process. Uh, all, all of the different jurisdictions that I mentioned, um, in addition to that, we have different data sets from different agencies. So the USGS um, provides our digital elevation model and our water data and everything else, which I'll touch on, but it's just this huge process of processing all the data from the photos and our field collection, along with the road data and trail data from, from the different agencies that we, we have to tie all together into a single data set. So this is always a very, very time consuming process that we spend many days in the winter when it's blustery here in Missoula, toiling away to, to pull this data all together. Um, and then after you've done that, you just hit control P and you print the map on your printer and then it's all done. Just kidding. Uh, that's not how it works. A lot of people think that that's how it works, but um, to, to make a product that, that we really want to stand behind um, is a really involved process with lots of different uh, design tools. So here's just a kind of a silly screenshot of a folder structure of our, our files that went into this map. Um, just to sort of drive home the point, I guess, that there's just lots and lots of different pieces to this that go into the final product that we eventually send off to the press to be printed. So um, this, this map was actually kind of interesting because it was a different, uh, kind of a different size of uh, landscape that we'd never worked on before. So um, a lot of our maps are, or, or I should say all of our maps up until now have been of a pretty large area. So we have to find the right scale for the landscape that fits on the page that we can send to the press. So most of our maps are on a 28 inch by 40 inch sheet. So both front and back of that 28 by 40 inch sheet. And that's what you see on the, on the right here. Um, so for example, the Bob Marshall was one to 80,000 scale at that full sheet for both halves of the Bob Marshall. Um, so if we were to do that same sheet size for the priors, we would have been able to do it probably at like one to 20,000 or something like that, which would have been would have been an interesting map to see the priors at that such such a, a large scale. But you know ultimately just was a little bit too large of a scale. We didn't need quite one to 20,000 for the priors. So, what we did was we chose a scale that was reasonable. So one to 63, 360, which is exactly one inch to a mile. Um, and we fit that on half of one of our normal sheets. So instead of the full sheet, we just did it on a half front and back and then fit uh, everything else that goes on on a map, which is the cover and the back cover and the text and the photos 
all have to kind of float alongside the landscape. Um, but we were able to do that on half of a sheet. So we, we, th we think it turned out pretty well. Um, it's, a, it's a smaller, lighter map, and it allows us to print two of them on one of the sheets. So this is hopefully going to give us flexibility to make more of these sort of half sheet maps in the future. So that was just kind of an interesting wrinkle to this project that we had to, that we had to work with. Um, the next step is uh, what we call, what you see on the map as shading, terrain shading. Um, it originally derives from what is called a DEM or digital elevation model. And what that is, is if you think of a, if you think of a grainy picture on the internet that you can see all these kind of boxes, those are called pixels. And what we start with is a data set from the USGS that's published and each pixel represents an elevation value in meters. So we take this huge grid across the landscape of all these pixels, every pixel is 30 meters on the ground and each one has a different value for an elevation value. And we take that and from that grid of numbers in meters, we can then generate a shading, a hill shading, they call it. So when you look at the map and you see the shading that helps you interpret the terrain, uh, that's what we've done to take this data set and then draw essentially this shading that we then really work with in Photoshop to make it pleasant to look at and make it intuitive without being overwhelming. So um, we start with kind of this, uh, data set and then you see what this black and white shading that you see on, on the bottom here. Um, and then that same exact data set, so that same digital elevation model that is this grid of elevation values, we can then process in a different way to create the contour lines. So every elevation value pixel that is the same as another one, we say connect all of those pixels and make a line. And that line becomes all the contour lines that you see on the map. So in this case, we say connect all of the boxes at 100 foot intervals that are the same. So it's this kind of complicated math problem, but the software makes it very easy. And then we get these uh, contour lines that we can then put on top of the map on top of the shading. So you get the terrain shading and the contour lines from that same USGS data set. Uh, and the next, the next uh, step is to then label those contours. So those lines that get output, uh, they come with what is called an attribute value. So there's a value attached to each line. And we can then draw labels with that value across the map. So we can say every three inches on the map, say, draw a label that is the elevation value. So we can draw on the, on the index contour lines, we can draw 5,500, 6,000. 7,000, and that's how we get all the contour labels that you see across the map is by uh, just automating that process and drawing those labels. Um, the next step is color. So we have a white shading with brown contour lines, and we want to help you interpret the landscape based on the uh, what the land cover is. So in the priors, it's very diverse, right? We have these red rock ecosystems in the in the south, forests um, on the north, and then kind of all the sage in between. So how do we show that? How do we show that coloration and make that intuitive? So what we do is we uh, start with lots of different products. We have NAEP imagery, so aerial photos taken from planes that are published, um, and also Landsat imagery, which is a satellite-based um, image that gets drawn. So we take the Landsat imagery and sometimes NAEP imagery, we make a final uh, aerial photo, and then we just really, really work with that photo to make sure that it's accurate and accurately depicting the trees, most especially, um, and then we smooth it and color it and tweak it so that it's not overwhelming and blends well with the map. So you get what you see here, which is the, the terrain shading, and then the coloration from that image that we've worked with on top. And we multiply those together to make kind of a nice backdrop that you see on the map. And then the next step is to draw grids. So 
one of the things that are really important on a map is to locate yourself. So we we draw a UTM grid, it's called, which stands for Universal Transverse Mercator. Um, and that's the blue grid that you see. Every every 1500 meter box, every, every blue box that you see is 1500 meters. So close to a mile. Um, and this works really well for locating yourself with a phone or a, like a Garmin GPS unit. You can, you can get the readout from the Garmin GPS unit or the phone and then very quickly locate yourself within that grid on the map. So that's the blue grid that's commonly used on uh, to, to reconcile a device to a map. And then the red grid that you see is what is called a, um, a graticule. So it is latitude and longitude lines. We draw them every five minutes and they have tick marks around the edge, but you'll see those and those connect the meridians across the earth. So North and South pole. And uh, you'll see both of those grids on all of our maps, including including this priors map. So after that, we add administrative boundaries. So this is a this is a pretty troublesome part because you have all the different agencies with different data sets, and you have to line all these administrative boundaries up, whether it's depicting a wilderness study area or ownership. And you have to stack them all together and make them all legible. So um, this is can be fairly complicated, um, but we work really hard to make those lines uh, visible and and intuitive. Um, and you'll notice that we use a black line and then a colored line, and the the colored line is inside of the black line, so that depicts uh, you sort of directionality of the line. So the Forest Service would be the green line pointing inside the black line is how you would is how you would interpret that so across the map that's that's what you'll see for all those colors the colored line with the black line around it um, and then the next step is hydrography so uh, very important is all the hydrography on the map so we have the usgs publishes a, a nationwide data set called the national hydrography data set and it depicts all the surface water across the whole country in a really detailed, really accurate data set. So we're able to take that data set and draw lakes and large rivers that, that actually have uh, you know, area and they show islands and things like that. But in addition, we have all the creeks. Um, and what you'll notice mostly on the Priors map is the difference between uh, perennial streams and intermittent streams. So based on that value, we can draw a perennial stream and a solid blue line and intermittent streams, which you'll see a lot in the priors as a dashed blue line. So you'll see these blue lines with small dashes. And what that means is that the data set from the USGS has said, this is an intermittent stream that, that may or may not have water there depending on the season. Um, and then, the next is roads. So roads are super important for access. Um, we also have to work between all the different agencies and different data sets to put together a single cohesive roads data set. And then we depict that by um, kind of this brown two wheel drive road and then a sort of dashed four wheel drive road that you'll see. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of a blunt instrument because the roads can, you know, a four wheel drive road can have such a different meaning, particularly in the priors, whereas like a four wheel drive road that a Subaru can get down and a four wheel drive road that is just a really rugged deep Jeep trail. So um, it's not perfect, but uh, we, we try our best to depict those roads and show you which ones are gonna be uh, drivable in terms of like a, a fast access road and a road that you might have to have four wheel driver just go slow on or think twice about using as with a vehicle. And then trails. So uh, there weren't that too many miles of trails in the priors um, compared to some of our other maps. Um, but as many of you know, I'm sure there's just tons of off trail opportunities to explore the priors. It's great landscape just to head up a ridge and, and walk around. But the trails that, that, that were um, there, we walked with our our GPS unit and made sure that we had as accurate as we could for those trails. Um, 
And then after we put the trails on there, we add annotation and trail mileage. So here's all of the labels and the mileages that we generate for each line segment. So we generate a, a 3D line segment, and then we can draw that label based on that value for each segment of a trail. So those are the red, those are the red uh, numbers that you'll see on the trail in addition to you know, road names and trailhead names and creek names and all the other annotation that we put on the map. So that's text is of course a huge part of the map. So that takes it takes a lot of time to make sure that labels don't intersect and they're accurate and they depict the area well. So we work a lot on the text. And then symbology is the last thing that we put on there. Um, we add kind of red dots between the trail mileages. We have trailhead symbols. Um, we have little points for all those spot elevations that we put on maps. Um, and those really, you know, those really drive a map, the symbology. So uh, we've we've used them for for years and years and we've kind of just stuck to it. Um, and, but that's the kind of the last piece is to put all those on there. And then finally, after you have that uh, document that you've made the map in, which is made in an application called Adobe Illustrator, um, we have that final map and then we place that map document into another Adobe application called Adobe InDesign. And Adobe InDesign allows us to have the map and then all the other elements that we have to put together before we can print it. So the cover, the back cover, the legend, all the text that flows, the images are laid out in InDesign. And then we have to work with that to make sure that we're not overlapping important parts of the map, but also fitting it and making sure that it will fold properly. So it's got a fold and, and uh, hit, hit the fold lines as, after you've cut it, cut the sheet. So there's a lot that goes into the layout in, instead of just, um, it, it, it's, it's complicated. <laughs> I guess, uh, to make sure that everything is going to line up when you when you finally get the, the, the map off the press. Um, and then after that's all done and we've gotten revisions and we're ready to go, we send our seal of approval and we actually just send a, a PDF document. So the same you know format or document that you've all worked with as a, as a PDF document, we send the same thing to the press and they take that um, they take that document and they split it into four, what are called plates based on ink color. So we have four inks, right? We have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And all four of those inks mix together to form what you see on the, on the final map. And there's a metal plate that gets created that lets the ink flow through the metal plate to the paper for each color. So we have cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And after it rolls through these big rollers of those metal plates, the final document gets sent out and that's the true color image that you see. So it's pretty magical. If you've never witnessed a, a big offset press running, it's a pretty cool thing to see the different colors of ink and then to see it all kind of magically come together at the end to show this final map. So it's really cool. Um, this image that you see here is a big press. So all of these uh, black big towers that you see, each one of those towers is for the ink. So you have a cyan tower with the plate and so forth that it goes down. And then I, the last thing I have here is, uh, well, I guess I have one more picture. So here's on the, on the left, you see these blank paper sheets getting put into the, to the press. So it sucks up with air suction cups, one sheet at a time. And uh, it's, it's all waterproof paper. It's all a poly-based waterproof paper, fully synthetic, so it won't tear and it's waterproof. It sucks one sheet in, goes through all those chambers. And then on the right here, you see the final maps getting put out the bottom. And then once it gets going, it's just going ch -ch 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 -ch, and each map only takes a couple seconds to print. So it's, it's a machine that's this huge machine that's like as large as a room. And it's, a, it's quite the piece of machinery. Um, and this last thing is just kind of a video showing this process. I thought it was kind of cool to see the press. Um, I'll, I'll try to pause it here as we go, but here's those big, those big chambers. There's six of them here, but we only use four of them for the different ink colors. 
And there it is sucking it up and running through. And then finally going out the going out the end on the other side. Um, so that's it. Um, I hope you're all still with me. <laughs> I hope you learned a few things about maps. Um, again, thank you to Wild Montana. Thank you to the Villains Community Foundation. Um, it was a real joy to work on this map. And uh, our hope is that it just strengthens the chapter there and helps people appreciate the priors. So um, with that, I'll take questions from, from Carolyn. So Jamie, there's a, a, a red a red curtain behind the screen, and they think that you're the man behind the curtain. So I uh, wonder if you want to stop sharing your screen and uh, show them you, that that you exist. There he is. Can you see me now? Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, since we're on the speaker for the uh, uh, the computer, he probably can't hear uh, questions. So we're, if you have questions, uh, I'll uh, repeat them uh, so that Jamie can hear. Yes, sir. Talk about the drying process. It must not take very long for the thing of that quick. Okay, drying process, uh, Jamie. Yeah, so if you, if in that video, you saw all the chambers that the map goes through and then there was a big flat section. And that's a that's a kind of speed high high temperature speed dryer that dries it just enough so that the ink won't stick to the map above it. Um, and they actually lay down this kind of fine powder on there that coats it so that the sheets don't just kind of meld together. Um, but even after they're all stacked together, you wait a full twenty four hours before you do anything else with them. Before you cut them, before you um, trim them and fold them, um, you wait so that the ink can here to that paper. Yeah, good question. Yes, Julie. I'm curious, um, after all the data coming up, showing the mapping that analytics, do you feed this into other apps like Alter, L9, and other things? Okay. Question about uh, uh, other map or other apps uh, that the, that all this information gets fed into other, other apps. And you can explain that uh, better than I can, Jamie. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, in, in, in 2023, there are, you know, there's probably 10 apps that I could name off for navigation um, in addition to, you know, this map and in addition to the agency maps. So the world is awash in data sets and, um, you know, they all use different sources. So OpenStreetMap is the commonly used one, which is this global data set that many apps use. Some piece together things like we do um from different agencies and different sources uh but you know since most of these data sets are public data sets uh all, most cartographers will start with the same process we did um with the different you know usgs and forest service and blm data sets or state data sets for ownership um and then the, the difference is kind of how how you work with those how much care you put in to either putting your own work on top of that or verifying that data. So um, that's what we work really hard on. But yeah, there's it's it's almost one of these things where it's hard to hard to know what data to trust because there's so much out there. So um, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we 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 use the same as as most people in terms of those base data sets. Yes. I apologize if I misinterpreted the topic of the discussion today, but if you were mixing up over, could you give me your top three trails or places in the five states? Did you hear that, Jamie? Yeah, top top places to go. Um, you know, I, I think that the, the hike up to the ice cave was a really cool hike just to get a, off of the, you know, to get a, up on top really quickly. That was a really cool hike. I would never, I wouldn't miss. Um, we actually took uh, gravel bikes to the northern end, and if you go to the northern part of the Priors, there's 
actually quite a few roads that are really good for biking. Um, so that was really fun. And then uh, Bear Canyon in the south, which is, uh, you know, it's a it's an area with lots of trails um, administered by the BLM. And that's another spot that would be the third the third one that I would say we shouldn't be missed. It's a really spectacular canyon. Um, gets you into that wilderness study area and just uh, super, super beautiful. Any other questions? Sir. Sure. So first off, gave me a nice translation of that and the process. Uh, if nothing else, that before had a lot of little corners of roads. It's hailing here, Jamie. So, uh, um, uh, it's yeah. It, but gentleman's gonna come and uh, speak right to it because yeah. Thank you. First off, nice job on the translation. Um, but the Custer Gallatin National Forest has a lot of trend uh, seasonal road closures and that are identified on the travel management plan. Did you attempt to even incorporate those, or what? What was your thoughts on trying to incorporate all those various closures? Because like, every road has a different closure date. Right. Yeah, the, the seasonal road closures, um, you know, that's always a tricky subject. And we take the same approach as the Forest Service on that. So on our map, we say always check the MBUM for current road closures. And the Forest Service does the same thing with their visitor map. So they publish their visitor map, but they say check the MBUM for those closures. So we do the same thing. Anybody else? Yes. What's the MBUM? MBUM is? Uh, yeah, motor vehicle use map. So the Forest Service publishes those for for all the district's areas, and that's the, that's the authoritative source for those road closures to know when gates open and uh, when, when they can be accessed. All right. Any other questions? All right, Jamie, I think that that's it. All right, well, again, thanks everybody for, for coming out and uh, yeah, have a good evening. Yeah, thanks, Jamie.